Welcome to Rich Planet TV. I'm Richard D. Hall. Today I will be speaking to a familiar guest who is here to talk about a subject that we haven't yet covered in any great detail on Rich Planet, NASA's alleged missions to the moon. Welcome Andrew Johnson. Thanks for inviting me back Richard, good to be here. Alright then, um, now recently Channel 5 screened a documentary all about this subject entitled Did We Land on the Moon? And um, throughout the program it presented some of the evidence that people put forward to make the argument that they didn't land on the moon and but at the very end it uh, left it right to the end it said oh well we can ignore all that because um, there's some fairly recent photographs of craft which have overflown the moon lunar orbiter type craft which has taken photographs of all of the remnants of the of the um, Apollo landers and all the rest of it uh, now we're going to go over some of that evidence and a whole lot of other evidence which may not have been in the Channel 5 documentary um, because just to give my sort of angle on this if you like is it, it's a bit of a diversionary argument in my opinion did we land on the moon because it when, when you get involved in that argument did we land did we not did they go or not um, what it does is it, di it diverts you from two very very important uh, questions or facts. Firstly, um, is there more advanced technology than rocket technology that can go way beyond that in a secret space program? It diverts your mind from mm -hmm. that. Uh, and secondly, it kind of makes you accept that the moon is completely inert and there's just, there was, it was under, you know, the, nothing's been there before, before now, if you like, or before right. 1969. Uh, and I also question that. So to me, it's it's what I would call a phony bone of contention. Contention is brought around something which diverts your mind from elsewhere. Because uh, I'm fairly convinced there is a secret space program with craft that make the um, the Apollo and the space shuttle missions look, frankly, toy-like. I, I uh, agree. Yes, I would agree with that. And I actually get it annoys me because people often say to me. Richard, have you been to the Kennedy Space Center? That's what they'll say. And they'll eulogize about going there. Oh, it's absolutely phenomenal. The technology there is amazing. Richard, you must go to the Kennedy Space Center. And I laugh at them and I say, what? You mean a firework? Because yes. that's, that's, what, that's what allegedly got us to the moon. I, th I think, you know, I think that just, to, just to add on to that a little bit, I mean, you know, here we are, two, two engineers, mm -hmm. you know, who, who looked at the Apollo program perhaps in their youth and I, you know, I've said this to people. I, I looked at the Apollo program in there in my youth, and I was inspired by it. I thought how fantastic this is, how wonderful this technology is, and what an achievement it is that we we've, we've sent these people to the moon. And 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 here we are, you know, so many years later, questioning all of that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also one of the keys that we must start. We must be willing to question these things, even though we may be convinced, you know, like you say, of the people, chap that said go to the Kennedy Space Center. We've got to be able to question whether what we're showing being shown at the Kennedy Space Center is actually you know the sort of real thing that it's ma meant to represent or is it as you say part of this phony bone of contention or a diversionary mm -hmm. thing to mm -hmm. divert our attention away from something else bizarre though that seems mm -hmm. now what makes me suspect there are far more exotic um, types of propulsion uh, are whistleblowers uh, such as uh, Stan Deo um, Edward Teller's alleged involvement in a, in a secret group that were, um, well, it was disclosed in the 1950s that they were looking at anti gravity technology, right. which went into the black in around about 56, 57. That's right. I mean, again, read Nick Cook's book, Hunt for Zero Point, where he talks about that and he mentions Project Winterhaven, mm -hmm. which is Thomas Townsend Brown's work, mm -hmm. and it appears that that was. The Th Thomas Townsend Brown work, which I believe you may be covering more in a future program, hopefully, mm -hmm. uh, that that went into the black. That's that's what Nick Cook, who's a defence journalist, suggests. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so this there does seem to be some tie-in with the timing. That you know, all the major U.S. Uh, air, airspace corporations were, were 
looking at anti-gravity as some type of workable technology or developing that as a workable mm. technology mm. Uh, up until about 1956 and then it was like oh no that's ridiculous right. you know we can't do that okay. o almost an overnight change as Nick Cook documents right. so now, in my upcoming series of lectures in May this year, I will be looking at one of the alleged forms of alternative propulsion, which in my opinion just completely transcend the rocket-based putting, putting explosives in a tube and setting fire to it. That's the extent of our supposed technology which has gotten us into space and to the moon. And I contend there's a far more advanced form of propulsion available uh, that they've kept secret. Now. I'm actually open-minded on whether the rocket-based technology landed on the moon or not. And now uh, Andrew's presented me with a lot of evidence because he contends that it, at least the rocket-based Apollo program did never landed on the moon. That, that's no, what would, you would, I would contend. Conclude, I would conclude from what I've looked at, yes, that, 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 that cannot have taken place that way. Okay, and we're going to look now, um, now that we've sort of set the, the scene that we, we're not saying that We've not been in the space. Right. We think this, there could be something major which has been kept under wraps. But we're going to look at the rocket-based systems, let's say, and, and, and ask the questions w whether they could have got to the moon's surface and back. Um, now, Andrew's looked uh, at this subject in a lot of detail over the years, and you're going to um, put forward um, your argument. Now, where do you want to start, Andrew? I usually start by discussing the pedigree, what I call the pedigree of the Apollo program really and you know it's, it's, it's fairly common knowledge that a lot of the NASA rocket scientists were drawn from Nazi Germany mm -hmm. um, you know and we have the, the, the so-called paper clips conspiracy that's the name given to it and that was actually revealed to me for the first time in the 1980s in a BBC Horizon documentary where it actually you know explained that uh, these scientists were brought over at the end of the Second World War following things like the V2 program which uh, you know launched all those uh, rockets uh, to London and mm -hmm. so on and it was Werner von Braun. And these were supersonic which um, meant that you couldn't actually hear them. R well yes I suppose that's true I wasn't really thinking of that but yes that, that was... A apparently in London yes. in the Blitz people feared them because a supersonic rocket you can't hear it coming because it's traveling faster that's than sound sounds. so right. it, it would just go off without, yeah, whereas yeah, yeah. your classic Second World War bomb is a and that's then you right. get a chance to run that's for cover, right. but that was why people feared them apparently right. in London. Right. Although I don't think they were that accurate, and I don't think they killed no, no, no. A lot so of I mean, no, I mean, there were a lot of problems they had to solve getting them up in the air, the guidance systems, and so on. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of technology involved at that <coughs> at that time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was Werner von Braun who was apparently the chief rocket mm -hmm. scientist. But we didn't have technology where you could fire a rocket from. London and hit Germany. That technology no. didn't exist. No. Where, but they did. They they could fire rockets from Germany that would land on London. Right. That that is a, that yeah. is apparently the case. Or they so were they were developing that in the latter stages of the war. Yeah. 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 You know, and the Doodlebug and uh, the V two, as I say. Right. Um, and then a lot of those scientists end up working in the States, mm -hmm. and you know they they obviously did a sort of brain drain from Nazi Germany, and they used it probably to build up their own. Uh, military industrial complex mm -hmm. but then that kind of uh, you know when the Soviets put up uh, Sputnik in 1957 that seemed to be sort of the start of the space race and the US then said oh you know we've now got to get satellites because you know the Russians could Russians could bomb us from space mm -hmm. I guess that's the sort of psychology and mentality that they were using at that time mm -hmm. Um, but then you need so a lot of those scientists ended up as part of the NASA's rocketry development program. Mm -hmm. Chief among them, as I say, was Werner von Braun, um, who worked for the Na Nazi regime. So we got this quote from Werner von Braun. This is from the, his book *Conquest of the Moon*, and it is, he says it is commonly believed that man will fly directly from the Earth to the Moon. But to do this, we would require a vehicle of such gigantic proportions that it would prove an economic impossibility. It would have to develop sufficient speed to penetrate the atmosphere and overcome the Earth's gravity. And having travelled all the way to the Moon, it must still have enough fuel to land safely and make the return trip to the Earth. Furthermore, in order to give the expedition a margin of safety, we would not use one ship alone but a minimum of three. Each rocket ship would be taller than the New York's Empire State Building, almost a quarter of a mile high, and weigh about ten times the tonnage of the Queen Mary or some 800,000 tons. 
and there's a you can see this clip in um, Apollo Zero, which is a free online documentary where uh, you'll see the cover of that book. And that was 1953 made that statement. I believe it was 53 and, that that book came out. This is a guy who can do all of the calculation with regards how much um, oxygen and hydrogen, high hydrogen pr propulsion can produce, and he's worked out how much fuel is needed to get there Correct. and to get back using standard sort of calculations. And he's right. Right. I mean, one of the key things I, I understand it from what I know about rocket science is delta V, the change in velocity, mm -hmm. because at each manoeuvre you're going to change velocity in some in some way, either to speed up or to slow down or to turn a corner, um, and th that's obviously when you use the fleet fuel. So you have to calculate all the changes in vo velocity that are going to occur, mm -hmm. and then based on that, you know how much fuel you're going to use based on the, the, the mass of the vehicle that you're going to use. Right. All right. Well, w what about the fact that once you've uh, at a fixed velocity heading towards your target in the moon, you do, in space you don't really need any additional fuel. You're no. Just, you're just sort of freewheeling, if but you like. Th that's right. That's right. But even, but even then, you need to slow down, don't you? When you come to the moon, you yeah, need to slow down. Obviously, yeah. Uh, in a controlled manner, and maybe in various stages. So at each of those stages, you use up fuel. Yeah. Okay, so um, what have you got for us next? Well, and then you look at, for example, the history of the Apollo program. It's peppered with some very uh, strange uh, events. For example, most people are aware that th uh, three of the early astronauts were killed um, in, in a, a fire in the capsule, um, and one of these um, astronauts was Gus Grissom, mm -hmm. and he was, you know, signed up early onto the Apollo program, and the, they started the training and so on, and they were, um, you know, working with sort of uh, developmental rockets uh, and capsules, and he he has there's this clip of him talking saying, "How are we going to get to the moon if we can't even communicate between three buildings when they weren't even able to you know talk from the capsule to one building to another? They couldn't do it because right. you know they hadn't they messed up the wiring or the radio signals or whatever." Right. And he, after a few weeks or months, he became a critic and said that this program was in such a shambles that they were never going to make it to the moon. Right. And he thought because Kennedy had done this with such fanfare, people needed to know about this. Mm -hmm. So he organised a press conference. Mm -hmm. um, and there's this story which is in this Apollo Zero movie, and it's also documented, that Gus Grissom went as far as uh, taking a lemon from his lemon tree uh, and put it on a coat hanger and then hanging it on the Apollo capsule when he was going in for his you know, his latest sort of set of training, mm -hmm. uh, because th this thing was a lemon, it was never going to work, it was never going to do its job, it was never going to fly. Right. Um, and then following that uh, press conference by Gus Grissom, an inquiry was launched into the state of the Apollo right. program, mm -hmm. and that was written up and it was presented to, you know, the appropriate part of the government as a review of the state of the Apollo program. And he was also very critical, he said they would never be able to do it by 1969. Right. And, um, uh, both of those people, the person who wrote the report uh, and Gus Grissom ended up dead. Gus Grissom in the, in the fire, uh, which, which uh, his son Scott Grissom later asked for an inquiry into that event right. and what Scott Grissom uncovered was that it did seem that like the capsule had been rigged to, exp to for the fire to start. Right. He, he thinks the fire was started deliberately so that okay. Gus Grissom, it, it does appear to me and I would tend to agree that Gus Grissom, because he was speaking out, they knew they wouldn't, wouldn't be able to help, you know, they wouldn't be able to keep a lid on the Apollo program because he was he was an honest right. guy, you know, he was going to speak out, so, so, you, they, so they killed him. So you think he could have been murdered by NASA? I, I think he was murdered in the Apollo 1 fire, along with, right. Ed, I think, Ed White, and I can't remember, unfortunately, the name of the third astronaut that died in that event. All right. Now, what about, um, a lot of evidence has been put forward, photographic and video evidence, because there's a lot of... Um, images allegedly taken on the moon, which I know a lot of people will pick fault with. W where do you stand on all of that evidence? Andrew? Well, I think it's a, again, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, I mean, I know Marcus Allen, for example, talks a lot about the, these images, mm -hmm. and I've seen a couple of his presentations. Yeah, and they're, they're very good. So, I mean, some notable ones, just off the top of my head. Um, there's one where there's a rock on the surface of the moon, and it's got the, the number C written on it. So right. it looks like a prop. Uh, and other ones, such as one astronaut's shadow is twice the length of another astronaut's shadow, yes. which suggests the light source is some is, is close to the astronauts right. within so many feet. 
the sun couldn't possibly produce shadows of that length therefore it's it's a floodlight the, the, which there, wasn't available there to are them. arguments about the angle the length yeah. and direction of the shadows but my you know in a, I, Th that's not the evidence you I use. don't focus on that right. because you can contest it I mean you know we've got this example so one of the ones that comes up quite often with mm -hmm. the shadow argument is is the clip of Aldrin coming out of the lunar module mm -hmm. and it's claimed by the people who think the photographs are fake that the, the illumination of Aldrin cannot be real because the Sun is behind the lunar module and therefore Aldrin should be completely in shadow mm -hmm. and you, you would not be able to see him but yet he's fairly well lit um, but I saw quite an interesting simulation uh, on a web page which I looked up and basically what this chap did is to test this idea that Aldrin should have been in shadow he set up a, a spotlight uh, and shone it onto a tennis court which is quite close an asphalt tennis court not a grass one quite close in colour to the lunar surface very dark and he set up some tin cans on the ground and uh, you can see here which to show this slide mm -hmm. you can see that he was able to see the dark side away from the light source quite quite well in in, in, sh in shadow so to me although that photograph still could be fake I don't think it's conclusive you can contest this idea that shadows mm. would have completely obscured Aldrin because in the simulation of that same situation you can see the dark side of the object what would be in the shadow so I don't think those arguments are, you know you can are conclusive I think they're right and detestable right now there's people also suggest and I think you've got another slide that might back this up that Stanley Kubrick who had been making the film was it 2001 a space odyssey uh, around that time that NASA used some of his sets and in particular a, a technique that he used called which was ahead of its time then it was a front projection screen system right to what that did it would well, allow you to use a screen to put a background on a, on a foreground sort of thing if we take it that the photographs were faked mm. well did who faked them did they have some specialist unit to do it or did they invite or you know otherwise get somebody like Stanley Kubrick to do it mm. and I you know when we discussed this and people said this to me a few years ago I thought oh, that's just nonsense you know that's just ridiculous there's no how are you ever gonna you know prove that it's yeah. just ridiculous but there is a very interesting um, documentary made by Jay Wiedner mm -hmm. um, called Kubrick's Odyssey which uh, as you just mentioned there looks at the front projection uh, system and then looks at some of the shots from the film 2001 Kubrick space film which coincidentally came out in 1968 which was the year before the moon landing or the alleged moon landing and it appears that uh, if you look at the history of 2001 you know it, it did the development of that film paralleled the development of the Apollo program and mm -hmm. even uh, Jay Wiedner points out that one of the scientists who is consulting with NASA on the Apollo program also works as a consultant on 2001 I mean that doesn't really you know that's that's he's probably just a good space scientist you know, it doesn't really prove anything right. um, but we, we have a couple of images of interest um, in particular which I think do possibly illustrate this front projection technique where it's been used okay. uh, and, 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 and this is one that's been put together by David Percy and I've just made an animated version of it you know, this is a NASA, a NASA photograph yeah. this is the Apollo 17 mission mm -hmm. um, and uh, so what we've got here is we have two pictures taken supposedly at different times on the same mission both Apollo 17 uh, and we see that in one shot we see a large lunar module quite close to it maybe I don't know 20 feet away or something and then in another shot we see an astronaut in the foreground and we see the lunar module over to the right in the distance maybe three four hundred yards away something like that but when you overlay these two sets of images you can see that the backdrop is identical mm -hmm. the field within the backdrop is, is absolutely identical so there's no way the lunar module would move from there over to there where it is how would it it would have to take off and land again if that's yeah. indeed what happened which is clearly ridiculous so the, so so that's a that's a fake background I, I i i think that this this indicates that jay Wiedner is right and what we're seeing this line here is the edge of the stage 
and we've got the the front front projection in the back in the backdrop. Right. Uh, and uh, Weedner does demonstrate. Uh, he draws a line on a lot of the NASA images, saying, "Right, that's the end of the set, and that's where the um, that's where the screen is. That's where the screen starts." Yeah. yeah. So I mean, I because think that, that's the giveaway in this um, front projection screen system. Right. You always have a, a border For, or yeah. a, a line where the the set ends and the, the screen starts and, and it's that line that you can sometimes identify because the texture of the the set will be slightly different to the texture of the artificial background correct correct they can't quite match up the right. you know the, um, the the details of it and I think that is I would get you know to me that I think that is what we're seeing in this picture you can see just below the the hill there um, we've got that front projection line going right across and, from right to left and of course this is quite a late mission what yeah. was Apollo 17, 17 so yeah. what year we're talking early 70s uh, that would have been early 70s I think yeah again I don't know all the dates of all the missions all right. and, and people have criticized me because I don't know all the Apollo t statistics you know and right. so on but uh, right. all right Andrew well we'll talk more after this break Welcome back. I'm talking to Andrew Johnson about the Apollo missions. Uh, now then, we were just looking at this image of an Apollo 17 mission, which to me, assuming that's correct, that they're both NASA images, that's a smoking gun, really, for me. Um, what do you want to talk about next, Andrew? Um, well, you know, again, there's probably one of the other uh, things which isn't discussed that much on the web is the pictures of the lunar rover. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some interesting things about the lunar rover. Um, as you may be aware, the lunar rover was only taken up to the moon, according to the you know official story, mm -hmm. uh, on the later missions. It wasn't, I don't think, until Apollo 16, I think, was the first mission where they used a rover. Mm -hmm. Other people have measured, for example, the size of the rover mm -hmm. and found that it, even if the wheels were folded up, as is claimed, there wasn't enough space to it to fit, wasn't enough space for it to fit in the command module. Right. That's other people have. I haven't done that measurement, but apparently people like Jim Collier did that, right. and say that they, they didn't have enough space for it in the first place. Mm -hmm. These pictures that I've got on the screen here, which we can show, are very unusual. They look fine again when you look at them initially, but if you study them carefully, there are no tracks around the wheels. It's like this rover has been picked up with a crane and dumped on the set, or the tracks go in the wrong direction. Uh, what image over on the right? which is AS17135205544, um, you can see there aren't any tracks, you know, in the front or back of the, of the rover. It looks like it's just been dumped on the set. Mm -hmm. So I have those problems. Um, whilst we're on the subject of the lunar rover, I can also go to some other data which somebody sent me a few years ago, and it's to do with the battery system on the rover. Before you go to that Andrew, we need to just explain what the surface temperature of the moon is when it's sure. lit by the sun. Just just explain. Yes, that. well I mean again if you go and look at the official data uh, for the surface of the moon, you know I mean I wouldn't use Wikipedia, I avoided that source, but um, the actual surface temperature uh, on the moon averages 107 degrees centigrade. So that's the average temperature on the surface of the moon. So it's, that's higher than boiling water. Right, right, 107 degrees centigrade, that's the average, not the maximum, that's the average temperature. Um, so that's 224 Fahrenheit to do the conversion. Um, and somebody sent me a few years ago an interesting link, a chap in Germany actually sent me this link, said go and look at the Lunar Rover Vehicle Operations Manual, mm -hmm. and this is a public document, it's on the NASA, one of the NASA archives, um, and you can go and download this document yourself, and it actually gives the specification for, and the tolerances for parts of the lunar rover system, one of which is the battery. And if you look at this column of data, these columns of data on their own data, maximum operating, operating temperature limit for the lunar rover battery is 125 Fahrenheit. 125 Fahrenheit. Which is in centigrade... It's going to be uh, about sort of... Uh, times by 5 divided by 9 and add 32 or something like that. Yeah, that, that's it's, right. It's going, it's, to, it's going to be about eight, 80 or 90, uh, 80 or 90 um, 
80 centigrade, right. something now, like that. Just, just to make a comment from an engineer, right? Um, I worked for years and years with hardware engineers designing mm. all kinds of different things, things that would work outside on motorway systems, things in power stations, or on railway lines. And <laughs> when you're designing something, uh, every, especially if it's going to work outside, whoever's manufacturing the, the sub-components, there will be a, a temperature range that it will operate in and you, you will you will not you would not select that component and if it was if it if its operating range was outside of where, where it's going to be used and that, so that would be the most standard engineering practice to do that so that for me that that is another smoking gun Andrew that the, the, the would fit a component especially at NASA uh, into a, a device that the specification was way outside its operating range it's it's just the most basic of engineering errors Right, absolutely. So we have, you know, you can see that right there from their own information is the hardware would not have worked. So, yeah, so, if, it, so if the rover could not have worked, yeah. then why are they putting out this story that they took up a rover, you know, took a rover to the surface of the moon? Mm -hmm. And also other people have pointed out, I haven't put it in my presentation, but uh, you can speed up the film of the rover by about a factor of one and a half times or two times. And it just looks like a car driving on a right. on a set, you know, with the dust flying and, up and, and there's so on. another you mentioned earlier that um, there's no c cooling system on those right. rovers, which right. would mean they would be ridiculously hot. Right. Uh, right. Okay. The, the components would all get very, very hot. Right. Uh, you know, and the tires would get very hot as well. Obviously, the, con the rover can withstand heat and so on, but and, you know, and all and kinds and of problems like that. And the same applies to the module that they used to get off the moon exactly. as well. Exactly. That would have uh, it was on the surface for hours. Uh, right. I mean, I, I think they were landed for I think uh, seven, eight hours or something on the first mission. I don't think they were there very long. But I, I pointed out to people. I think in this presentation, I also make a point of it. If you you know drive to the supermarket and you're on an asphalt surface, you go in and get some stuff and it's a hot sunny day in the middle of the summer mm. and it's 25, 30 degrees, you, you put the windows up so that nobody nicks anything from your car, you come back to your car after maybe half an hour, mm. whatever, an hour, and you put your hands on the wheel and you're going to hurt your hands. It's if gonna it, be, and if it was 107 degrees? How did they maintain the internal temperature? to uh, you know, uh, uh, something that the astronauts could stand. Mm -hmm. They claim that they had battery power for the air conditioning, that's the official claim as I understand it, that the, the air conditioning within the module is battery powered. Mm -hmm. But you, you can compare it to a car because you can have, you can, you've got three guys in there, so you're going to have a similar sort of volume of air within the module to a car. You don't have any convection on the moon because there's no atmosphere, so a car can be cooled by convection, in other words when you start driving the car the air, the air coming yeah. past the car will cool it down. You can't do that on the moon because there is no there is no gas to give that sort of cooling. So you can only cool it by radiation. So how did they do it? How did they keep the lunar module cool? Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, it's, when I thought about it, I never thought about this years ago. You know, when I was, I believe the Apollo story. How did they keep it cool? Now, also related to temperature on the surface of the moon, one of the astronauts on the later missions actually placed. That's right an object on the moon is for sort of sentimental reasons. Just tell us about that and you've yeah. done a little experiment to try and replicate this. That's right, Charlie Duke and um, what he decided to do is for, you know, because of Mama's apple pie and those sorts of American, you know, sort of uh, uh, cultural ideals, yeah. uh, looking at the Charlie Duke photograph, Charlie Duke was one of the astronauts uh, on Apollo mm -hmm. uh, 17, I think, mm. uh, or Apollo 16, and he took this photograph of his family with him and he put it in a clear plastic bag and he put it on the surface of the moon and we have a NASA image mm -hmm. of that family photograph in other words a photograph of a photograph allegedly on the surface of the moon mm -hmm. and I saw this web page two, three, four years ago and it said well this is impossible because the average temperature of the moon, the average temperature is over 100 degrees, 107 Fahrenheit and if you have... Centigrade. Uh, 100, uh, sorry, centigrade, correct, uh, 225 Fahrenheit, so yeah. ab above the boiling point of water. And if you have a photograph, now uh, remember photographic paper is made of a number of layers, it's you know got uh, a layer you know, that actually takes the, the image and makes the image with whatever chemicals they put on them, that have a lot like a card layer behind it to give it some rigidity. Um, and those layers, when heated up, expand at different rates. Mm -hmm just like a biometallic tri strip in a, in a, in a thermostat mm -hmm. would. Mm -hmm. So this photograph will curl up mm -hmm. and you can, you can show this. All you need to do is get a photograph, 
put it into an oven uh, and or, you, or and it, it will curl up. And you did that, so let's just take a look at it. So um, here we have a uh, family photograph and uh, over here we have an oven and uh, this oven is set to 100 degrees centigrade and I'm now going to put this photograph in the oven she's cooking some of my dinner and then I'm going to watch it through the glass and that you can see that in very short order trying to get better light but you'll see it when I open it this is curling up within seconds so I think that's a pretty convincing demonstration and here it is you can see it there curled up and that's only at 100 degrees centigrade w would it behave the same with air around it do you think Andrew do you think right well, I mean a that's a question but I haven't done this in a vacuum so it doesn't it's not a hundred percent accurate simulation but uh, I don't I don't know of any reason why having air around it would uh, stop it from, from curling, curling. yeah right. yeah I mean obviously in this example the air is transferring the heat to the photograph mm -hmm. but in the in the example of the surface of the moon mm -hmm. The, 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 the bag was in contact with the surface of the moon, yet it didn't, there appears to be you know, no significant effects on the heat. So that right there, to me, proves that that photograph cannot be taken on the surface of the moon. Right. And you showed um, an image of a footprint, which is a very famous image, right. um, from an astronaut's boot, which shows very clear, uh, very well defined lines of the sole of this boot and you would contend that that looks like it's got moisture in it well this is you know again if you you look at that image it's the iconic image of the first footprint on the moon uh, i made a couple of observations about this photograph remember these were cam uh, cameras were mounted on the chest of the astronaut so he's going to have to bend right over mm -hmm. to take a good clear picture of this they have no viewfinders um, but the shot is well framed so that's one comment about that particular photograph. But the other comment, as you said, is about the impression. If you look at the way that those grooves of the boot are pressed into the surface of the moon, to me, you know, I mean, maybe some expert in materials who can correct me on this if I'm wrong, because you know, I wouldn't say I'm an expert on this, but to me, to get that sort of impression, you need moisture to mm -hmm. bind those particles of so if, you, so if you were on just a sandy beach with no moisture, it wouldn't leave a print like that. No, no. If you've got if you've got Wellington boots on and you're on the top part of a beach away from the sea where it's the sand is all dried out completely mm -hmm. and it's just you know grains, you, do, you don't get footprints get like that. You don't. But get you would it. nearer the sea where it's still damp. Correct, correct. And that looks like that footprint has been made in you know some type of um, sand with moisture in it. Right. All right. So. And, and the surface of the moon won't have moisture in it? Apparently think? not, because again it's 100 degrees centigrade, so all that any moisture would have boiled off. Now, I mentioned in the Channel 5 documentary, probably the main uh, argument they used to debunk the people who don't think we landed on the moon was the, the photo, they said the photographs, recent photographs have been taken by lunar orbiter that's overflown most of the Apollo landing sites and filmed all of the junk that was left behind, the rovers, the flags, the, and the actual craft. So is that not incontrovertible evidence, Andrew? Well, you would think so, wouldn't you? And uh, you know, people have made various claims about these images, and we talked about these Chinese images, which have supposed, I, I've not seen those, I, I've not. We'll, we'll come on to that. We'll right, OK. That. But, uh, but this, this story for me starts probably four or five years ago when I suddenly sent me an email and saying, well, Andrew, can the Hubble telescope see the images on the moon? Because everyone's heard of the Hubble telescope. It's a big, you know, space telescope, very powerful and so on. It takes all these wonderful images of the various galaxies and so forth. So the argument is, all they have to do is point the Hubble telescope at the moon and see everything that's on there. End of story. Sort right. it out, you know. Okay. But again, it's not as simple as that because if you look at the figures, and it's easier than you think to work this out, you know, and we can explain this very easily with a bit of uh, sort of GCSE level uh, trigonometry basically mm. uh, and we can say well we know the size of the lunar module approximately 
it's 4.2 meters across so we've got an object sitting on the moon if you're looking at it in plan view it's 4.2 meters across basically mm -hmm. um, you can then l look at what the distance from the earth to the moon is mm -hmm. uh, which is 385,000 kilometers that's sort of an average figure obviously it goes up and down from that because of apogee and perigee and so on um, but if we take those as a basic set of figures you know you can you can add a factor of 10 either side of that if you really need to um, and it, this will still show you the answer uh, and then you, can, you, get, you end up with what's called an isosceles triangle and you can work out the angle because why we want to work out that angle that I've labelled on the diagram is that equates to what's called the resolving power of a telescope. Any telescope that's built it can resolve individual objects of a certain size mm -hmm. and that, that size is measured as an angular separation mm -hmm. not a physical size because mm -hmm. the, the angular size is, is you know what you actually right. see and the physical size is it varies uh, sure. you know. so just to explain that Andrew okay so if you look at the moon and draw a line from your eye to the top of the moon and draw another line from your eye to the bottom of the moon they make an angle. That's that is right. the angle subtended to your eye and each right. the telescope will have that it's a very very small angle that telescopes can normally resolve Correct. Uh, can see objects at, at an angle that small so the Hubble telescope has a resolving angle. Yeah. That's right that's right and you can you can check out what that is you know you can find mm -hmm. that information it's measured in seconds of arc because mm -hmm. as you, people probably know you know a circle is divided into 360 degrees mm -hmm. and then each degree um, is divided into 60, seconds, uh, 60 minutes and then, and then each, each minute, minute is divided into 60, 60 seconds. seconds right. So in each degree you've got 3600 seconds of arc mm -hmm. um, and you can look up the Hubble's revol resolving power and uh, it comes out at 0 0.05 seconds of arc mm -hmm. uh, so that's as a fraction of a degree that's 0 0.05 over 3600 mm -hmm. so it's 1.389 times 10 to the minus 5 degrees is the resolving angle, resolving power if you will, mm -hmm. uh, of the Hubble Space Telescope or depending, uh, we have another figure which I found uh, and, and that came out as um, 3.89 times 10 to the minus 6 degrees so that makes it even more sensitive, you know it can resolve even smaller objects. Right. But if you do the calculation for the lunar module you come out with a figure of 3.3 um, or well, there are 6.26 times 10 to the minus 7 degrees. So the the side, the angular right. size of the lunar module on the surface of the moon is 6.26 times 10 to the minus 7 degrees. Which, and that's a factor of 10 times too small. Correct. For, oh, yeah, the, yeah. for the Hubble to be able to see. Yeah, correct. Right. So it's 10. To, it's essentially, that's it's so actually about lunar, 20 times. Right. Yeah. But so if yeah. the lunar module was say 30 times bigger, then it would be able to see it. Right. But it right. can't because it's right. too small. Correct. Okay. Correct. According to the figures that I've been able to work out, and obviously if there's any viewer you know that finds an error in these calculations they've been up on my website for several years uh, and I've never I had one small correction but it was only right. by a factor of two which didn't affect the factor of ten so if anybody finds an error that I welcome any criticism of that you know mm -hmm. of any any part of the argument so in other words w all we can say is the Hubble Hubble's no good can't do it with Hubble mm -hmm. um, and so we have to look at something else right so NASA uh, brought out these images of all of the remnants of the Apollo missions correct all right so case solved uh, that's right, of course NASA uh, had the, what's called the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, I talk about this in this presentation that I put together and that was um, b launched June the 18th 2009. Well just hold it there Andrew, uh, we're going to go for another break and we'll be looking at NASA's alleged images of the um, Apollo Debris relics, relics uh, after this break. Welcome back, I'm with Andrew Johnson and we're going to look at some images put out by NASA which allegedly show the remnants of the Apollo programs taken by Lunar Orbiter Craft in what year did he say Andrew? Well this, what happened was in 2009 the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter was launched, it had a you know, high resolution camera sort of better than the previous one and I think the original uh, mission for this mm -hmm. was to look for new landing sites for the new uh, moon mission program which was announced some years earlier now it's all been scrapped mm -hmm. uh, and we'll mention that again later but 
so lunar reconnaissance orbiter everyone said oh we're going to get these new high resolution high resolution pictures of the moon we're going to fly over the old landing sites we'll be able to see the craft and that'll you know prove all these crazy conspiracy theories you know wrong mm. um so uh, these were images we waited with great fanfare and finally uh, i think it was the 11th of august 2009 uh, sorry 11th of september i think it was actually when these came out mm -hmm. 2009 um yeah, it was an interesting date. Um, <laughs> was it the 11th of November or it's 9/11? It was 9/11 day anyway. Yeah. Um, and what we see on NASA's website is the supposed picture of yeah. the Apollo 11 site, and the Apollo 11 lunar excursion module, the LEM, is shown as basically a, a sort of reasonable sized white blob with f three and a bit white blobs around it. Mm. And you can see this sort of the feet, the feet exactly, right. feet of the of the actual uh, you know the landing part hmm. that they left on the moon, um, and um, so basically with this, and there's a scale on there on there's them, a scale on, on, there. on their image, correct, and they give you this figure of two hundred meters, so when you look at the space between these dots, which is meant to be the feet, you know of of the uh, the, the the lunar excursion module's landing section. Mm -hmm. You can then work out how big mm. the, the, this, this distance is because mm. they give you a scale. So this is what I did. I worked this out. So I found out the size of the, the distance between the feet, which is uh, uh, of the lunar mo module mm -hmm. excursion, yeah. uh, lunar excursion module, and it's 31, uh, 31 feet mm -hmm. diagonally across along the long, the longer length. Yeah. Okay. Right. So if you plug that into the figures that NASA gives you for the size of this image, that uh, lunar excursion module landing section should be, fit into a space seven by seven pixels on that image. Seven, seven by seven pixels. pixels. That's the figure you come out with. Or maybe it'd be eight by eight, okay. possibly yeah. nine by nine or something. Mm -hmm. You know, you could you, maybe slight margin of error, something mm -hmm. around that figure. Uh, so when I actually measured the, w what this alleged photograph shows, and I measured the distance across, uh, it's basically a distance of about 28 pixels. Right, which means so it's a factor of four too big. Roughly between three and four, depending on how you sort of uh, turn the image and so forth. Right, but so it's completely the wrong size. Yeah, the image so it's the short. wrong size. And, it's the wrong size. And we were talking about UFOs. Uh, we were. And funnily enough, it, it, let's say um, I, I brought out an image. I had someone on the show who was eulogising about an image. Hey, so, so hey, let's say we was taken from a helicopter. Yeah. Yeah. Hey Richard, I've, I was in my uh, helicopter the other day and I filmed this UFO, it's phenomenal, look at it, look at the picture. And if, if they showed that, what would people say? Exactly, if you showed that as a, an image of an alleged UFO that you took and you didn't have anybody else's photograph of it to mm -hmm. back you up, would you believe that that was a met metal object resting on the ground below you? Mm -hmm. Would you believe that that was a real photograph? Yeah. Um, um, people will believe this because it's on NASA's website. Yeah. Because NASA say that is it's the real. Apollo 11 uh, craft then people believe it is. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But if you look at the quality of that image and you study it, this, I don't know whether this will come out on the well, video. Well, as you say, it's a white blob, Andrew. It could be right, anything. Right, right. You know, and, and, and then you look at these other, and, and then what I tried to do is I tried to get an impression of what it should look like, mm -hmm. and I managed to find, this isn't, again, a p totally realistic image, because uh, we see the lunar module in orbit um, rather than landed, but I tried to get an impression of what we should see on that LRO image, mm -hmm. um, and the by by resizing it by resizing down it yeah to, to a seven by seven pixel uh, image or a twenty five by twenty five pixel image which is the size I calculated it to be, and then I compared that with the uh, the NASA image, mm. and there is, you know, there's the, 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 it just well, doesn't add up. If, if you compare it to Google Maps or Google Earth, right. which a lot of people are familiar with now. It's pathetic. It is. Now, I, I, we've got to be careful here because I actually made a mistake with this part of the analysis originally in that, yeah, we look at the Google Earth images, and um, but some of those are not from a satellite. Some of them are aerial photographs. Right. The, the ones Earth. that are down, Yeah, the, the Google Earth ones. Some of them from aerial, some of them above from a certain plane. height yeah. are from a satellite, right. and some are from a plane. But we do have a comparison um, with GOI. And this is something that Jarrah White has done. He's another uh, researcher that's posted quite a few videos about this. And we have a GOI image, which is essentially the same resolution as the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Just, just to stop you there, Andrew, GOI is a, uh, a satellite which goes around the Earth and takes photographs. Correct, okay. correct. At a particular height or distance. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. And I mean, you know, I think they've got their own website and stuff. I think they sell these images 
I don't think this satellite is owned by NASA. I think it's privately owned by a consortium or something. So he's compared images t of Earth taken by that satellite with images taken by lunar orbiters. Right, and I think that because the um, uh, the image resolution is comparable according to the f mm -hmm. you know the, the information given so you by get NASA. The same level of detail. Same level of detail. So so in this particular example, we see a GOI image and you can actually see a car on the road mm -hmm. and you can see with some you know you can see it's in color you can see the color of the car yep. you can see that it's good maybe got a, a white bonnet or a cream bonnet or something but you can see that it's you know you can see that it's an oblong shape this right shape for a car and everything and you can measure it and work out the size so why haven't we got and there's none of these vertical grainy lines either if you look mm -hmm. at those LRO images they've got these vertical lines in them for some reason which I don't really understand what those are um, so if you compare these two images, uh, the, the, why isn't it in colour for one? Why isn't it in colour? Hmm. Why we? Why, and the same goes with the images from Mars. Why are we still predominantly getting yeah. black and white images? Well, we'll come on to we'll Mars. On to that. <laughs> so, so but that going back to that. So why, why have we got such rubbish images from LRO? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, the ones from GOI are pretty good. Yeah. You know. So the first one that they put out, allegedly of Apollo 11, it's it's just a white blob and it's completely the wrong size. It's four times yeah. too uh, big. Right. Um, now, what about the other images? Because they, they they brought out other images of the other Apollo landing right. sites. Right. Right. And in fact, on this particular slide, we've also got a, a couple of things. We've got uh, the, I think this is the, on the bottom right here. We've got the Apollo 16 lunar module, mm -hmm. which you'll see looks different again. We've got this sort of, it looks like it's exploded, we've got this black smearing around it. Mm -hmm. um, and and on one of the other ones, I, 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 we could dig this up uh, as we go through it, but if you look, I think the, the latest images, it does look a lot better. They've actually made it look like a lunar module now. I, don't, right. I didn't check the size of it because that came out after I put the original presentation together. I think they did another image in 2011, around about that sort of time, uh, possibly early 2012. And they they've improved the look. It looks more like a real lunar module now. Right. Um, but here we see the lunar rover parking spot on on the on the right here. This is this is their label. This is what they say. And we've just got this black smudge with a few white dots next to it. That right. that according to NASA is the lunar rover vehicle. Which if um, you know if we remind ourselves what it looked like, going back to this slide, mm. we've got the lunar rover parking spot. Mm -hmm. And it's a black black smudge. Right. Uh, what's that about? Right. Is that is that really become that? I mean, does this make any sense? It certainly doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. Wh why why is there a black zone around what looks like this this solid area in the middle? What's the black zone? I don't Presumably know. it's shadow, but it wouldn't shadow wouldn't be cast like that. You wouldn't have thought all around. No. It. No. Uh, it looks a bit strange. It does. So you would contend that all of those images are bogus then? I, I would contend that they must be bogus, yes, yes. Right. I've heard two different stories about the Chinese um, images because they are alleged to have had a lunar orbiter, is that? Or, or uh, I, believe, I believe so, yeah. Right, so I heard initially that they'd brought out images in, I think, February 2012, but I had an email from somebody saying, well, actually, why haven't they released them for public viewing? So I'm not sure whether the Chinese images are available, but they're alleged to be extremely high definition. So maybe we can check that after the show and just put a caption on as to the status of this. Right, because, right. Um, people would say, well, if, if China have seen them, then, then they're obviously there because China represent an independent adjudicator if you like this is one argument that i always use as to why i'm ambivalent about it i'm not i don't get caught up in the argument of whether we landed or not because there was no guy with his clipboard stood there on the surface of the moon watching the thing come down going yep tick landed tick like they do in the national lottery they have a guy there with his white gloves on an independent adjudicator where is the independent adjudicator in the Apollo lands. We've got NASA and NASA's word. Hey, China is the independent adjudicator. But hang on, is 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 China independent? Which was a comment that Judy Wood made in the previous show. Right. That do we believe that at some level countries are actually acting independently, especially with p pertaining to space, um, or is there some overarching agenda? 
there's a lot of information um, that Andrew has on the moon landing, so we're actually going to do a film, a second show. I, I think that, um, that there are other things that they're possibly hiding as well uh, concerning what is on the moon and uh, the UFO phenomenon as yeah. well, which we'll, yeah. we'll probably talk about that next week. Um, All right, secret space program on the second yeah, week. Yeah, yeah. Um, right, let's, let, let's just address some of the arguments which people uh, claim prove that they did land on the moon with the rocket-based Apollo missions. Uh, now, there's a um, radio dish was placed in Australia because the Apollo, um, the position of the Apollo craft couldn't wasn't always in radio contact with the, with NASA, so they so they had to use a radio station um, near the, on the southern hemisphere, which relayed messages. So. How could they fabricate that? Right, yeah, I mean, there's this story is told in the film The Dish, uh, which has got Sam Neill in it, and you know, these two guys in the outback working this dish, which mm. made sure, they had to make sure it worked to pick up the signal mm. from the landing. <clears throat> and, um, but that doesn't prove they landed because it's very easy to put a transmitter in a space capsule and send it to the moon. I mean, if, if if unmanned probes had landed on the moon already, such as Lunar Cod One, the uh, Soviet rover, and, and you um, you you would agree that they landed on. The moon. I think they must have landed, uh, you know, unmanned probes on the moon. Right. I'm pretty sure that they went. Um, but the manned missions, that, you know, that would be a completely different kettle of fish. And that, that, that's Australia. that's the other question you're talking about: communication with NASA. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got this room full of. Um, operators looking at screens who are all monitoring different elements of the mission they might be monitoring the astronauts heart rate or the voltages within the cabin and and then you see them all get up and cheer and hug each other when they've allegedly landed so what are they all part of the conspiracy Andrew or well I mean that's a good question another good question are all these people looking at all these screens part of it you know were they all told not to talk to me the the, the most obvious thing seems to be that they uh, you know, they did have to set up simulations for the equipment to run through all the procedures. For most of them, for the majority of them, they may be watching one or two systems, you know, looking at the measurements coming back, mm -hmm. the telemetry. Um, are they going to know whether they're watching a simulation or the real thing? Okay. I so, think so you think the majority of them would have been duped as well, so they keep, they keep as few people into the... Right, the I think so. Now, what about um, Apollo 13, I think it was, where they had a problem and what they started losing oxygen in the in the cabin as they were coming back. Is that right? Was it a problem? Yeah, I, 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 oh, no, they, they never got there. They were, they were, they were yeah, they had to around. turn back and uh, they had to manufacture something which would get rid of the carbon dioxide to keep them alive, basically. And all of these scientists at NASA started scratching their heads saying, well, what's, what's in the cabin? What can we give them to make? And they made a device which would get rid of the carbon dioxide. Uh, so do, do you think that's all true? Well, um, I, I again, I don't think Apollo 13 landed on the moon. I don't even think it went round the moon. Um, so that, that again, was a whole, whole thing with stage managed, I think partly because people were losing interest mm -hmm. in the Apollo mission, and they needed to keep its profile high enough for long enough to do you know what they right. wanted to do, which we'll perhaps talk about in the next program. But um, um, one of the things that John Lear pointed out about uh, the Apollo 13, which I, I believe is correct, and again, if any of you wants to verify this mm. and find find different, then great, if we can be corrected on anything that's wrong, or I can be corrected on anything wrong, but John Lear said that if you look at the, the, the proposed time for the landing of Apollo 13 on the moon, which it never actually landed, uh, according to the official story, mm. it would have landed in darkness. If, mm -hmm. And I've simulated this in a solar system simulator called Redshift. Yeah. You can you can uh, you, you can look at the uh, timing of the landing, hmm. and it, indeed it appears that it would have landed on the dark limb or very close to being in the dark. And you you would not they land. Would, they would never do that. No, they would, would never be, be land in the dark. It would create immense problems for them to to land in complete pitch black. Right. All right. Now you mentioned John Lear, and he, he has um, analysed a lot of the early images put out of the moon, uh, as has uh, Bill Cooper. And um, they actually claim there are structures on the moon, uh, which we'll, we'll look at uh, next week uh, into those claims. And also, just to just to touch on the astronauts, because we're going to take a closer look at what some of the astronauts have said 
uh, in next week's show, you contend that, that they are all um, in s either persuaded or mind-controlled in some way to perhaps either believe that they did walk on the moon when actually they, they didn't. Well, I mean, again, if you look at their behaviour, or those that have been, you know, interviewed about this, I mean, like, a couple of them were dead and uh, mm. so on, part from, uh, and Neil Armstrong died at recent levels, but if you look at their behaviour, um, it indicates that they be they do believe their story, mm. but the stories are not consistent, the stories don't right. add up. Right. That's okay. the problem. Okay, Andrew, well, we're going to look more into the astronauts next week, but uh, that's all for, for this week. And remember, believe none of what you hear and only half of what you see. I'm Richard D. Hall. Good night. <laughs>
uh, got divorced um, around about this time. He around about that time, yeah, I learned. And later, he did an interview in 2005 with Ed Bradley. I think it was a, and and it, Ed Bradley, you know, said in the sort of uh, background information that Armstrong had his marriage of 38 years had broken up mm -hmm. in 1994 which was the very year he made this speech at the anniversary and you know looking at his body language you know which is one thing I know you talk a lot about Richard mm -hmm. you're much better at that than I am in reading it I mean um, and uh, he uh, you look at his body language and it lo looks like he's saying look I'm gonna tell now I'm, I'm fed up of you know keeping this secret I'm mm -hmm. gonna tell as much as I can mm -hmm. and that's that's what Neil Armstrong said to me in that speech right okay now let, let's just take a look at that then I'll call that one up <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Vice President, Mr. President, members of Congress, fellow astronauts, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Wilbur Wright once noted that the only bird that could talk was the parrot, and he didn't fly very well. <laughs> So it didn't fly very well. Everyone's laughing there, Andrew. But you think Armstrong's referring to someone who was murdered, one of his colleagues? I think he's referring right. to Grissom, yeah. All right. So I'll, I'll be brief. <laughs> <laughs> this, this week, uh, America has been recalling the Apollo program and reliving uh, the memories of those times in which so many of us here, the colleagues here in the first rows, were immersed. Today we have with us uh, a group of students among America's best. To you, we say, we have only completed a beginning. We leave you much that is undone. There are great ideas undiscovered. Breakthroughs available to those who can remove one of truth's protective layers. There are places to go beyond belief. Those challenges are yours. In many fields, not the least of which is space, because there lies human destiny. remove one of truth's protective layers. He's not talking about scientific discovery but with that statement, is he? I was surprised by that speech because mm -hmm. if he was talking about discoveries, he would say, you know, we've had recent advances in computer technology, we're now getting the internet developing, you know, he would have known about the, the early development of the internet, I'm sure, uh, in, 19, in the early 1990s when mm -hmm. the internet started to get going and, you know, the World Wide Web was started and so on. You would have thought he would have spoken more in that, in that sort of language rather than truth protective layers, I mean, what protecting what exactly? And l let's just play the clip of the astronauts at the Apollo 11 press conference where it clearly looks like they're uncomfortable with, with what they're being asked to do at the conference. This is, they just returned fr from the moon a few weeks earlier and it's their first sort of public airing. Uh, just watch the body language in this clip. It was our pleasure to have participated in one great adventure an adventure that took place not just in the month of July, but rather one that took place in the last decade. We all here and the people listening in today had the opportunity to share that adventure over its developing and unfolding in the past months and years. It's our privilege today to share with you some of the details of that final month of July that was certainly the highlight for the three of us of, of that decade. We're going to divert a little bit from the format of past press conferences and talk about the things that interested us most, in particular the, the uh, things that occurred on and about the moon. 
we will use uh, a number of films and and slides which most of you have already seen and with the intent of, of pointing out some of the things that we observed on the, the spot which may not be obvious to to those of you who are who are uh, looking at them here from the sur surface of earth the our, our memory uh, of that actually differs little from the reports that you have all heard from the from those previous Saturn V flights. And when you first stepped on the moon, did it strike you as you were stepping that you were stepping on uh, a piece of the Earth, or uh, sort of what your inner feelings were, uh, uh, whether you felt you were standing in a desert, or this was really another world, or how you felt at that point? Well, there was no question in our minds where we were. We'd been orbiting around the moon for quite a while. <laughs> At, at the same time, uh, uh, we have experience. Uh, what do you consider the most important piece of advice and recommendation that you will give the Apollo 12 crew before the takeoff for the moon in November, gentlemen? Rec I didn't hear the first well, part. Recommendations for 12 on which phase? Will be the most important piece of advice oh, or recommendation for the Apollo 12 crew. Uh, I think we can say that overall uh, we wouldn't change the the plan that we used or the plan that they intended. Uh, will you recommend any any changes in procedures for the uh, moonwalking and exploration procedure? And uh, did you find that your suits were mobile enough in view of the changes, or would you recommend further mobility features for them for operation on the moon? Well, one gets used to the tight mobility that your suit affords you. Secondly, when you looked up at the sky, could you actually see the stars and the solar corona in spite of the glare? Uh, many of us and uh, many other people in many places have speculated on the meaning of this first landing on another body in space. Would each of you give us uh, your estimate of what is the meaning of this to all of us? <laughs> and of course, Andrew, uh, these three guys all resigned shortly after they came back, which, which Neil Armstrong, I think, was going to be set up as NASA's spokesperson, this kind of thing, but quite a religious man, or very religious man, and the sort of man who I, I think Armstrong has strong principles, I think he's a, a, a highly reliable person. And I just think that he left because he was being asked to tell lies, possibly. What, what are your views on that? Well, I mean, we could, you know, again, we're speculating with the reason. We don't really know why he resigned. One could, you know, one of the arguments that's just come into my mind, for example, is that they knew he was going to need to go on to do lots of interviews and lots of public appearances, which actually he didn't do that many of. But mm. nevertheless, you could argue that that was going to take up so much of his life that he wouldn't be able to continue with the astronaut program because he was so famous. You know, you mm -hmm. could make you could make that argument, but in, but actually he didn't give that many interviews he, in proportion to the the sort of figure he was. He gave relatively few, and that's one of the things that people have have pointed out. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and you know, why, but why would Aldrin resign? Why would uh, Collins resign? You know, why didn't they want? Why didn't they um, become uh, trainees for the next group of astronauts or something? Right. You know, that would seem more logical, wouldn't it? But focusing on Collins, what he said at the press conference, which he'd shown the clip from, there's one hi thing we can highlight, <clears throat> and he said that in the press conference he distinctly says, because well, Armstrong is asked by Patrick Moore about seeing stars, mm. uh, and that, sorry, in the, in the solar corona. I think is what Patrick Moore's interested in. Could you see the corona around the sun? Mm -hmm. And Michael Collins says, I don't remember seeing any stars. We were never able to see stars from the lunar surface or on the daylight side of the moon by eye without looking through the optics. Uh, I don't recall during the period of time that we were photographing the sonar corolla what, uh, what stars we could see. I don't remember seeing any. 
you know, so he's in the command module, do not remember seeing any stars. Yet, he, he writes in his book, Carrying the Fire, um, on page 221 from uh, 1974, this book, that he, he was on a Gemini 10 spacewalk. Uh, my God, the stars are everywhere, above me, on all sides, even below me, somewhat, down there next to the obs that obscure horizon. The stars are bright and they are steady. Of course, I know that a star's twinkle is created by the atmosphere, and I've seen twinkleless stars before in a planetarium, but this is different. This is no simulation. This is the best view of the universe that a human ever had. So why... That's Michael Collins. That's Michael Collins speaking about his Gemini 10 trip, but according to the press conference with the Apollo mission, he says he didn't remember seeing any stars. Mm. Okay. I mean, this is one of the stories which does not add up. Right. Now, um, another astronaut who is alleged to have walked on the moon is Dr. Edgar Mitchell. And um, you made some comments on a previous Rich Planet show uh, about Dr. Edgar Mitchell, which I think you've received a few emails about. Yeah, a couple of emails, that's right, when I said right. he was the sixth man never to walk on the moon. You right. know, and well, we made a little joke about that. And right. the, you know, that my, my reason for saying that comes from this, this data, this right. evidence. Well, let's, w w what we're referring to here is um, alleged free energy devices, in particular one called the N machine, which was developed by Brewster Palmer. Brewster Palmer ended up dead, and he was visited by Dr. Edgar Mitchell in what year would that be Andrew uh, roughly? It would probably be uh, in the 80s I think sometime in the right. 80s I don't know the exact year but probably mid 80s right. early 80s something okay. like that. Well let, let's just watch this clip. Well, basically he was visited by the Apollo 14 astronaut Edgar Mitchell mm -hmm. who saw who heard about his end machine came to see it working and then Edgar Mitchell made De Palma a paltry offer to buy out the machine uh, and De Palma says no I'm not you know I wouldn't sell up for that and then Mitchell said to him, Edgar Mitchell, the same Apollo 14 guy, said to... The sixth man on the moon, to, the sixth allegedly. Man to never walk on the moon. Um, Sorry? Yeah, the next day, exactly, yes. The sixth man to, to not be on the moon, uh, so he could be somewhere else at the same time. Um, <laughs> so you don't think Mitchell walked on the moon? No, he didn't, he didn't walk on the moon. He, um, that's a whole other story. But, right, OK. Uh, anyway, <laughs> it depends on which of this you edit in or out. Yeah. But... Um, <laughs> I'm just going into this. So side Mitchell, and so, so it's a device using a similar principle to Trombley's, over unit, the allegedly called an N machine. The N machine. Um, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, who we know as Apollo 11 astronaut, not Apollo 11, Apollo whatever, 14, whatever, yeah, 14, 14. Uh, tries to buy his device. Or Correct, or it makes him an offer. De Palma refuses, and then uh, Edgar Mitchell says to De Palma, according to De Palma, if you're going to go around doing this sort of thing in California, you're going to get your head blown off which, of course, De Palma said was a threat. One of the pivotal people that uh, I encountered early in my uh, career was Edgar Mitchell, the astronaut. Mitchell became extremely interested in De Palma's end machine. He made De Palma a paltry offer to buy out the invention which De Palma naturally refused. He said to me that uh, if I ever tried anything on my own in California, I would get my head blown off. And De Palma further you know, and this is another topic I wanted to comment on, says that, you know, Mitchell then went on in, was at that time involved with the Institute of Noetic Sciences, and that is still going, IONS, Institute of Noetic Sciences, and Mitchell talks about that, and there's various other people involved with that. I know that uh, Yuri Geller has been involved well, with that. Mitchell's IONS. very much into um, healing using electromagnetic fields and uh, telepathy or consciousness, right. this psychic kind of thing. phenomena. Psychic phenomena. And, and that falls under the remit of this IONS research that he claims to be, you know, kind of involved with helping to get credibility for. Mm. Uh, and De Palma says that that's basically a CIA front, that those sorts of organisations like IONS are a CIA front to keep an eye on what people are doing, you know, who are coming up with these free energy devices, what sort of things they've developed, how they're trying, planning to develop them. Uh, and that's what De Palma says in this clip. De Palma himself, he was ended up dead in 1997. So you think uh, Dr. Edgar Mitchell is, uh, is an operative then? Of some kind. Quite serious claims there about Dr. Edgar Mitchell that he's, he's not quite what he seems. Um, can you expand on that? Well, I mean, one of the things which caught my attention was something which was on Richard Hoagland's site, the Enterprise Mission, and that's a transcript of an interview that uh, Mitchell did with Richard Hoagland, I think in 1996, uh, it was actually yeah May the 15th, 1996, and um, Edgar Mitchell talked about people asking him what it felt like to walk on the moon. Mm -hmm. He said that people would ask him what he felt like what he felt like to walk on the moon, mm -hmm. 
and um, he said I didn't think it was a germane question mm -hmm. and germane means relevant so in other words he didn't think having a feeling of what it was like to walk on the main we didn't think it was relevant to talk right. about that um, and then when he thought about that for a bit he said um, should I know what it felt like oh sorry should I know what I felt like on the moon so I went to some good friends of mine Dr Jane Houston and her husband Bob Master and said help me find out what I felt like on the moon right why would you go to somebody to ask them to f help you find out what you felt like when you so walked on the moon and I think he, went, he underwent hypnosis as part of this therapy and, 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 and then he said this was when his consciousness was you know expanded and this is what spurred him on to form this right. IONS the in Institute of Noetic Sciences which Bruce De Palma claimed was a CIA front correct now um, do you want to talk about uh, uh, Bart Sabrell now yeah Bart Sabrell I mean he's done a couple of great uh, movies for people looking at this area and I think the evidence in them is pretty pretty compelling almost you know all of it mm -hmm. um, and he made a, a, a movie called uh, um, a funny thing happened on the way to the moon mm -hmm. it's about one hour 45 minutes 55 minutes that sort of time S so he would approach some of the Apollo astronauts and he would challenge them well the first movie looked at some of the things we've looked at right. and then he, he came across this footage uh, where there's an apparent shot in the Apollo 11 capsule where they're in, in earth orbit and they're trying to make it look like they're uh, a long way from the earth and they're showing the earth at a distance when in reality it's they're in low earth orbit so this this video is a is is shot from inside the command module and it's looking at the earth correct um, but the astronauts are claiming to be filming it from the window but they're actually filming it from the, the back, back of the, the spacecraft craft. yeah some people have claimed that they had a maybe a, a cut out they had a, a cut out a cut to, out to, to obs earth, correct right to obscure the craft and to perhaps make the earth into a crescent shape that's right the whole thing trying to make the earth look further away than it was correct that's, that's what the, the object of the exercise and you could see this where they take away the cover and they switch, they switch the lights on on the capsule so that the blackness of space you know is n no longer right. simulated right. And, and so uh, Bart Sabrell uh, when he gets an interview with Dr Edgar Mitchell he shows, he shows him that particular clip he shows him this clip yeah. and at one point you can see somebody's arm which is showing that the camera was not at the window but it was further back further in back, the craft correct. so correct. I don't know whether they were trying to hoax make it look like the earth was further away than the moon or not but what's interesting to me is 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 um when Bart Sabrell starts discussing this with Dr Edgar Mitchell it's what happens after that this is what is this oh this is a shot from 130,000 miles out mm -hmm. uh, uh, I guess it's from approaching the, it's from approaching the moon looking back at the earth mm -hmm. now I've seen this on a couple of flights this was this something that you got, although this is from Apollo 11, did you shoot a shot of the Earth like this? Mm-hmm. So you had a, a TV camera in the spacecraft. That's correct. And this is, I guess, the Earth zoomed in at a distance. Yep, seems to be. I think it be. shot a little bit halfway to the moon. Mm-hmm. Now it's kind of, you know, I guess the cloud cover looks what you're looking right. at. Now what is that right there? What is what? There's like an arm, it looks like hair on an arm getting in front of the window. Yeah, maybe somebody maybe <laughs> somebody got their <clears throat> arm in front now of I it. I thought that was the arm of God <laughs> moving <laughs> right, across yeah. the earth. Yeah. I couldn't quite figure that out. I suspect out. that was the edge of the window, more than likely, that they were shooting at. What did the earth look like from a great distance? There About it is like again, 130,000 miles out. About like that. So it's pretty small at the distance of the moon? Yes, but I think the better images are the Hasselblad images that have been taken on every flight and are the most published pictures in the history of the world. What is that in the top left? If that's the Earth, is that like another spacecraft? No, oh, no, no, no. That, I have no idea what that is. It's uh, some aberration on the film of some sort. Oh, those are shadows, I think. Or reflections, probably reflections that are just reflecting. Put that back again, so we get another shot of it. If we you're going to press me on this, I'm not going to talk to you anymore, because I won't pursue this. 
all of this attempt to say the Apollo programs were fake is just sheer nonsense. And you can talk till hell freezes over and you're wrong. Okay. Well, would you affirm? I will continue well, on this line. Okay, turn off the camera. Your interview is done. I've given you all the time I'm going to give you. Okie dokie. Good to meet you. I don't say it's a pleasure. Understand. Please get your ass out of my house. Okay. And you came here under false pretenses, and I think you're an asshole. Well, and if you continue this, and if you press us, I will personally take you to court. I, I hope that you do. I invite you to. I'm going to give you my card so you can arrange that. And I'm encouraging I, you to you're arrange. Frank, you're frankly not worth it. No, no. I, I, we have you on the record saying you'll take me to court. I hope you do. Because we have proof that would prove it in a court of law that Apollo 11 didn't go to the moon. <laughs> and I think it's something that you should see. It. I don't say that lightly, believe me. I don't say it lightly. You're, you're, you're joking, it. sir. People can have fun. And maybe do that if they feel like they want to have a little fun on a trip to the moon. As an independent producer, okay, we're heading out. Doing that is against moral ethics. Lying about going to the moon is a satanic lie hey, of gigantic proportions. I don't hit people, but you're going to be on the deck unless you... Well, I'm heading out. I appreciate it. And get the hell out of the black house. You ever get a gun to shoot them at them before they get out of the office? <laughs> we have a video camera running if you want to do it. Right. I, I, that would be great footage for us. See you later. In court, I hope. Want to call the CIA? Have them whacked. Welcome back. I'm talking to Andrew Johnson about Apollo astronauts. Okay, Andrew, so Dr. Edgar Mitchell's son clearly says in that clip, uh, shall we phone the CIA and have them waxed? What does that mean? You tell me. It's not an expression I'm familiar with. We can, we can speculate what it means. It doesn't sound very complimentary. Does it mean, you know, um, we, we have, the, have their memory erased? Does it mean we'll have them killed? So it's, uh, it's a pretty safe bet then, based on that evidence and based on the Brewster Palmer evidence, that Dr. Edgar Mitchell is working for the CIA. In, or some version thereof, yes. Right. Uh, as some kind of operative. Uh, as I, right. would, I would say he is, yes. Right. And you're convinced he didn't walk on the moon? Correct. Right. I am, yes. Right. Okay. Well, the people may not be, but I am. Right. We've got some clips here of um, Bart Sabrell approaching Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong. And you believe in UFOs? Do you believe we've been visited by UFOs? Why do you no, want don't. to believe this? I know for, I know for a fact we've had this analyzed. And this, this is the window. And you're in, in a state by an atomic clock at the Goldstone tracking station. And this is the tape. Well, you're that talking to the wrong guy. Why don't you there. talk to the administrator at NASA? We're passengers. We're, we're guys going on a flight. We're I, know not for, I know for a fact that it didn't happen. You really like it, don't you? You're the one who said you walked on the moon when you didn't. Calling the kettle black, if you ever thought of it. Saying I misrepresented myself. Get it away from me. You're a coward and a liar and a thief. Mr. Armstrong, Bart Several, ABC Digital. Wanted to give you the opportunity to swear on the Bible that you walked on the moon. Will you put your left hand on the Bible and swear to God that you walked on the moon? Gentlemen. Mr. Sarpro. Yes? <clears throat> if you really walked on the moon, why would you not do that? So why don't you just put the into the record in the argument and put your hand on the Bible, swear to God you walked on the moon. Mr. Sarbro, yeah. knowing you, that's probably a fake Bible. Really? Yeah. Well, no, it's a real Bible. You have the opportunity to have $5,000. The meeting is not open. Well, you have $5,000 cash. You can give it to charity if you swear on the Bible that you Please. walked on the moon. Please I have the tape. That'd be fine. Why don't you I swear won't. to... Why not? Why won't you do it? So why don't you put your hand on the Bible and swear to God that you walked yeah, on the moon? Mr. Seibel has made a fool of himself in front of the world. Mr. Seibel, you do not deserve answers. Neil Armstrong is visibly shaken by that. He does not want to swear on the Bible that he, that he landed on the moon. What do you take from that, Andrew? 
Well, I mean, again, you know, it's it's more speculative, but yeah. it's it, it, you look, looking at the body language and the reactions. Unfortunately, you know, there is a conf confrontational situation, particularly with Neil Armstrong, where he's Sabrell has burst into this business meeting that mm. Armstrong's addressing. So it's not an ideal mm. situation, you mm. know, to get a kind of honest statement from. Um, you know, so you can see that that it's it's not a great situation now. The the, the clip with Armstrong, Sabrell, you know, I've heard him interviewed and he regrets having done that now. Right. He regrets that Aldrin punched him in the face and so on. It got to that. He he, he but I think at the time he was so annoyed. He was so you know. Well, he, he thought he'd been conned. By yeah, he so felt so conned by these guys right. that he, he felt he had to go up and tell them. You know, I'm, you know, he says you you you, you said you walked on the, the moon, you didn't. You know, and and Aldrin's uh, accusing Sabrell of slimy journalism. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Sabrell thinks well, you're accusing me of slimy journalism. What about you being slimy all these days, say, saying you went to the moon, and you didn't? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and so so it, it's very uncomfortable to watch, and unfortunately, that discomfort um, takes away a little bit from. You know, the, being able to sort of evaluate it dispassionately and look at what's actually being done and said and and this mm. sort of thing. So uncomfortable to watch, but I think nevertheless a good documentation of statements from the astronauts right. about what they claim to have done. Now, um, I actually think they're covering up other things, um, not just that perhaps the rockets weren't capable of getting to and from the moon. Um, now, Buzz Aldrin has made quite a few statements. Um, in the media regarding um, a monolith on Phobos and the fact that he says that the Apollo mission was followed to the moon by a UFO. Right. So let's just take a look at that clip now. There is something out there that um, was close enough to be observed and uh, what could it be? Travelling alongside Apollo 11 was a mysterious object like this one filmed on a later mission. If the object wasn't part of Apollo's rocket, it could be only one thing, a UFO. Mike decided he thought he could see it in the telescope and he was able to do that and when, when it was in one position that it had a series of ellipses. Now obviously the three of us were not gonna uh, blurt out Hey, Houston, we got something moving alongside of us, and uh, we don't know what it is. You know, can you tell us what it is? We weren't about to do that, because uh, we know that uh, the, those transmissions would be heard by all sorts of people, and uh, uh, who knows what somebody would have demanded that we uh, turn back because of aliens or whatever the reason is. So we, we didn't do that, but we did uh, decide we we just cautiously ask... Uh, Houston, where, how far away was the S-4B? Apollo 11, Houston, the S-4B is about 6,000 nautical miles from you now, over. And a few moments later, why well, they came back and said something like it was 6,000 miles away because of the maneuver. So we, we really didn't think we were looking at something that far away. So we decided uh, that after a while of watching it, uh, we it was time to go to sleep and not to talk about it anymore until we came back in, in debriefing. Okay, so clear statements there from Buzz Aldrin that uh, there was something else other than just the Apollo craft. Uh, now, he was, after that documentary was made, I believe he appears on a radio station and he seems to be backtracking on what he said. He's asked if this was the case and he changes the subject essentially. I have been uh, uh, just uh, always interested in extraterrestrial life, and uh, and I, I just I don't know if it's true or not, but I had heard that someone was saying that you had seen a UFO. NASA said don't say anything about it, and we might as well get it from the horse's mouth. Buzz, did you see anything unusual up there? Well, you know, a guy uh, by the name of Charles Berlitz wrote something about the Roswell incident, and to establish his credibility, he had a little table in the front of his book which attempted to take advantage of uh, alleged observations of people, of uh, unusual sightings. And, and he specifically referred to Anglia TVs reported this, that, that had been cited by somebody else, that uh, Neil and I saw some uh, green things, green creatures. <clears throat> well, this kind of 
spoiled my credibility and uh, and a lot of uh, other people. So uh, I decided to take him to court and uh, sue him because he was uh, uh, repeating phrases that were inaccurate. Wow. He's not done the right kind of, uh, well, we won the suit. Uh, and and I, you know, hopefully it would uh, cause a few people to be a little bit more careful in, in how they uh, try and treat trusted servants uh, of our government and of our people to to tell the truth. Um, and uh, I, I I just feel that uh, it's a little irresponsible of people uh, to, uh, especially after so many years. To, to bring up subjects that uh, that have been explained rather thoroughly, um, especially uh, in uh, in our case in debriefings. All right. So he's clearly avoiding talking about being followed by a UFO. Uh, well, he, I, I say he flip flops on this show. On the one hand, he cla you know he claims to have seen something that followed them, mm -hmm. and then in the coast to coast clip, it's like he says, "I'm you know people have tried to misquote me about." seeing you know extraterrestrial things All right. you know so it's like he's flip-flopping on the issue right. now there are a number of other people who alleged to have seen um, things on the moon uh, one of them is Carl Wolf who spoke at the Disclosure Project conference we've shown this clip several times before on Rich Planet because I find it a very compelling clip this uh, engineer Carl Wolf is trying to re repair a piece of photographic equipment and he is shown images of things on the moon. So let's just take a look at it. I was interested in how the whole process functioned, how the data got from the lunar orbiter to the laboratory. I asked the young man if he described the process to me. He did. About 30 minutes into the process he said to me um, in a very distressed way, um, by the way we've discovered a base on the backside of the moon. And then he proceeded to put photographs down in front of me, and clearly in these photographs were structures, uh, mushroom-shaped buildings, and towers. And at, at that point, I was very concerned because I knew we were working on compartmentalized security. He had breached security, and I was actually frightened at that moment, and I did not question him any further. She was approached by someone who was in quarantine with the Apollo astronauts. Right. Um, who said, and the astronauts had told this person who'd come to her um, that there was a base found on the moon. Another incident, I knew someone in quarantine with the Apollo astronauts. He told me that the Apollo astronauts saw craft on the moon when we landed. And that is what he told me. And he also was afraid, he said, that the astronauts are told to keep this quiet. They're not allowed to talk about it. He was a psychiatrist. Right. Uh, and he worked on the Apollo project. Right. And he was involved in the quarantine of the astronauts. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't the, nothing to do with um, quarantining from viruses or bacteria. From information. It was the information yeah. and you know, um, making sure that the astronauts were OK. And, uh, and he said that uh, the astronauts had told him that's about the base, it was the base. base on the moon. And I will testify under oath before Congress that what I'm saying is the truth. Okay, so claims of bases on the moon, claims of other craft on the moon. Um, what do you make of that? Well, again, you know, winter is just more of speculation, but with a bit of, you know, bit of testimony. Mm -hmm. uh, I also think that Carl Wolf is, is telling the truth mm -hmm. about seeing this yep. photograph of the base on the moon. Uh, and then, uh, as we were discussing earlier, uh, you know, whether we'll get time to get show this particular clip or not, I'm not sure. But the William Hamilton clip mm -hmm. from 1998, where mm -hmm. he was at a conference in MUFON, mm -hmm. LA, and I've shown this clip many times in presentations I've done because I think it overlaps between the testimony about the secret space program mm -hmm. and what's going on on Mars. There seems to be some overlap with with, with this thing that uh, William Hamilton uh, tells you this this account that he mm -hmm. t he comes out with. Um, so uh, th there are a number of you know areas um i mean i i have mixed feelings about the stories of stuff on the moon i haven't seen a lot of good images i think i've seen more interesting images coming from mars about stuff on mars than i have from the moon mm -hmm. john lear is a big you know uh, uh has a uh, sort of big statement about the bases being on the moon and there being mining operations and he claims he's got pictures of them and they're on his website he even has a website called thelivingmoon.com mm -hmm. as you're probably aware 
and I think there's some interesting stuff on there, which, in, in all honesty, I haven't studied in great detail. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but some of some of the stuff that I've seen, it's, it's clearly you know not not correct. Um, there was a, an image I saw a few years ago, which was claimed to be a moon base, and it's actually part of a, a Disney film, a segment of a Disney right. film. It's a still from that, yep. and that circulated around as a moon base. So, well, when I interviewed Timothy Good, um, he did claim that. Um, a German doctor had spoken to Neil Armstrong at a NASA conference and been overheard making similar statements. So let's just take a look at the clip of Tim Good. Also, from a friend of mine, a former lady who worked in MI6, she met Neil Armstrong in Italy and uh, he confirmed to her, she'd overheard a conversation of him talking to a German doctor at a NASA conference and then she confronted Armstrong with this information and he admitted yes there were craft on the moon when they landed and uh, they were very frightened by it and they felt threatened. Welcome back. I'm talking to Andrew Johnson about the moon. Now we've moved off the topic of did we land on the moon because uh, in my mind it's clear that something is being hidden and some people think it's just that we didn't land. I personally think there's a lot more to it than that and we listened to some statements before the break of people alleging that either craft or bases are, are on the moon and that other people have alleged that there is a secret space fleet not just spacecraft, space fleet, or fleets even, uh, that are being flown from somewhere on the globe by some secret group. And um, I think that's likely. When you look at the backward technology, the rocket technology that they're still putting on display for the public, I, I think we, we have propulsion systems that go way beyond that. And one person is, uh, who's alluded to this is Gary McKinnon. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you know, at the end of the presentation I put together, I sort of move into this area of, of the secret space program. I don't talk so much about the, the moon bases and such, so you know, I'm glad we sort of had a chance to mention that. But Gary McKinnon talked about discovering this spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet, with the title of non-terrestrial officers, you know, as part of his hacking into the Pentagon and NASA systems. There was um, an Excel spreadsheet and uh, the title was non-terrestrial officers and it had names, ranks, um, was it a long list, didn't even fill the whole screen I think. Um, well could you also... just generally say how many, I mean if you were to guess, uh, guess are we talking 20, 50? 20, uh -huh. um, maybe 30. Uh, and the other thing was a list of um, ship to ship and fleet to fleet transfers, you know, bear in mind fleet to fleet, so multiple ships. Um, of materials, um, and these ships weren't, you know, U.S. Navy ships. Um, again, I don't remember any of the names, mm -hmm. um, but I remember at the time looking and trying to match up the names, and uh, there wasn't anything that matched. What did he discover? Was it, some people have said that this was just from a computer game. You know, it, what he'd seen was somebody's plan that they were playing on a on a computer game. You know, uh, one of these uh, games like Homeworld or something. All right, and it's and it's interesting to note how Gary McKinnon was dealt with by the Americans or, or what they threatened to do to extradite him and, and put him in prison for 70 years. That's what they were threatening. Going back to 9-11 for a moment, the alleged 20th hijacker, I think his name was Zachariah Massawi, I think it was, I may have got the mm. pronunciation hopelessly wrong, but he was named as the 20th hijacker and he was, he, they wrote an indictment against you know, a set of criminal charges mm. and uh, they arrested him um, and had a hearing. It wasn't a trial. It was a hearing, and they dressed it up in the media as a trial, but it wasn't. It was a, it was a hearing, and um, his uh, indictment was written by somebody called Paul McNulty. So Paul McNulty was a U.S. government official who was responsible for writing the indictment for Zachariah Masai, the twentieth hijacker, and he, he also wrote Gary McKinnon's indictment when they leveled the charges against Gary. Right. So I thought that was an interesting uh, sort of uh, tidbit right. that uh, I learned. So 
in other words, it's two areas that they're covering things up on. Seems that to this be. person may be connected in some way. Se seems to be. All right. But again, you know, you, you bring in the th things like. Um, uh, the, the, the photographs of Ed Grimsley with the night vision binoculars where he seems to have picked up these sort of semi-cloaked ships uh, mm. that you can see with night vision goggles some of this evidence together and the other one that's in my presentation is John Leonard Walson who seems to have disappeared off the scene he he uh, said that he's developed this um, optical method linked to a 10 inch telescope where he can resolve certain things in orbit which uh, I don't know how far out they are and if you watch a film called Interstellar mm -hmm. you'll see some of these objects that he's filmed and they really do appear to be up there in the night sky if you watch all of the film I don't I don't think that these that he's making this up and right. so it, whatever he's filmed is very right. unusual well, now the other person that you mentioned was um, William Hamilton who spoke at a MUFON conference MUFON is the mutual UFO network uh, in the late 1990s and he mentioned that he'd made contact with someone connected to this alleged secret space program who was telling them about the various space vehicles and space platforms that they have. Um, do you want to just touch on that, Andrew? Yeah, well, we can show the clip, but, but the interesting thing that caught my attention, well, many interesting things about the clip, and I've shown it, a number of talks I've given over the years, very kindly sent to me by a friend who lives in San Francisco. Uh, a few years ago, she sent me this on a DVD. And... Um, uh, you know, he talks about, uh, William Hamilton talks about meeting this uh, 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 colonel in the Air Force and he, he said that he'd been on this ship to Mars, a sh ship that could leave the atmosphere mm. and travel at 8 tenths the speed of light, 0.8 C, as we'd see it written down, uh, and go to the planet Mars. And he said they landed a base underground and, you know, you can hear the rest in this clip. Is this story true? Well, we, we may never know, but again, it's stacking these things up into some kind of pattern, you know, mm -hmm. which is what, what you right. and I try and do. Let's take a look at it. Uh, this colonel is a a real warrior type guy and he had a a degree in uh, plasma physics and he was also a consultant to NASA and he was a consultant to uh, people out at the Palos Verdes nuclear power generating station just uh, west, 50 miles west of Phoenix. The other thing he said was there was a base on the moon. I find that quite astounding. I mean, I'm, I have heard astounding things, not only from this colonel, okay, but also probably the highest rank was a retired three-star general, lieutenant general in the Air Force. And he knew another guy that I was in contact with, and this other guy claims that he worked seven years on the U.S. anti-gravity program. I have a fraction of what he told me, and I've got a tape recorded. It's true. Whoa. What a sham the space program is. Because there's another space program going on, a secret space pro program. And that's what I was attempting to find. In fact, you don't have to go too far to find that there is some secret space programs going on because... They had their own shuttles and their own astronaut crews right out here at Vandenberg Air Force Base, unbeknownst to everybody, and they scuttled a $5 billion facility that was housed there at one time. That was back in the 80s. But the kind of space program he was talking about is using a spacecraft that can leave the bounds of our atmosphere and travel to the planet Mars at point eight C eight-tenths the speed of light. And I said, how do you know that? I've been there, he said. Interesting words there from William Hamilton. Now, there is something which has been covered up in physics which um, can lead you to how these propulsion systems are possibly working. Uh, and uh, like I say, they were, they were developing anti-gravity in the, in the late 1950s and then it went it went black as they say and and all they put out is rockets rocket based technology um, that's what makes me suspicious that there's, there's there is something hidden and why would they hide it the answer that I would give is that if everyone had access to that sort of technology you could create a vehicle which could get you into space quite easily and get you to the bottom of the ocean
uh, and you could travel anywhere. They don't want to give people that freedom. What, what, do, would you go along with that, Andrew? Yeah, I mean, if you, again, if you look at the evidence and you tie together stories like William Hamilton's story, you look at the research of Nick Cook and what happened in the 50s with the you know gravity anti-gravity research and so on mm -hmm. it really that's where it all points to you know and, and then there's these stories of the nazis developing saucers at the end of the second world war mm -hmm. how many of those are true i'm, I'm not sure but you know it, it tends to be pointing in the same direction that there is this separate development which is almost completely hidden mm -hmm. and all we see see of the, the, the those developments are these silent craft that people mm -hmm. report you know and, and very regularly um um, I mean, in Hamilton's clip, he, the guy said that uh, he, he was in touch with somebody who worked for seven years on the U.S. anti-gravity program, mm -hmm. you know, which is completely undisclosed. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Stan Dale is another person who was alleged right. to have been probably on the fringes of that program, but still involved in the late 1960s, and he has claimed uh, that there is a base at the South Pole. That is his claim. Uh, and Dale, I find, an extremely convincing whistleblower. So if they are flying craft, that's my bet. That's where my money is, that there's a base at the South Pole. It may sound crazy, but why would someone as credible as Stan Dill make that claim? I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm not convinced about the base at the South Pole, other than the McMurdo Station, which Michael mm. Palin went to in his documentary, right. that we know that that's there. But as to secret installations, I mean, it's a very inhospitable place. Uh, and with this sort of technology, you, you would be able to hide it elsewhere which in places that were more hospitable right. um, so I'm not, I'm not sure about the I think I, don't, I haven't seen credible evidence of, of right. that. Now what about other theories about the moon Andrew because I've heard it said that there was a probe one of a NASA probe on the moon a vibration probe that if some physicist analyzed the signals from it and said well the moon's hollow because it's actually ringing when when this probe is being struck uh, I, oh, I believe, well, yeah, there was a probe, that I think it was a, maybe a, a seismometer that they had on the moon, and then a you know, m fairly sort of reasonable size asteroid struck, struck or meteoroid or whatever, you know, a few mm -hmm. tons in size or whatever, and it was enough to register on this seismometer, and, and they said it rang like a bell, mm -hmm. uh, and the implication being you know, the moon was indeed hollow. Uh, and I've, I've, I read one of these books years ago, you know, the, the, about the moon being a, a, a space station and not, you know, mm. not a, a, a rock. That, that it was towed into place, yeah, yeah, it's artificial, yeah, that yeah. it's got engines inside yeah, it. Yeah, you, you, you apparently, you know, they claim that if you look at the, 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 the width of the craters and, and consider how deep they should be based on the size of the impact, that many of these craters are way too shallow, you know, for what, right. for what the, the, the speed of the impact should be. Now, I don't know, and I haven't looked at those things. Uh, m myself, so my own personal jury is still out on what the moon actually is. Right. All all I will do is point out some unusual things about the moon. One is that um, uh, it's you know w we get the total solar eclipse and the to sorry uh, yeah, from using the size of the moon. Mm. Covered you know the moon is 400 times smaller than the sun, but it's 400 times nearer. The sun is 400 times further away. In other words, so we get this perfect eclipse effect, which is how can how can we get that? You know that's mm -hmm. that's a weird. Coincidence. coincidence and of course you know the the uh, motion of the moon seems to be tied in with a woman's menstrual cycle uh, which which I don't think has ever been properly explained to my knowledge if there is right. anything to do with that you know so right. it, it's true the, that it does the, seem to have an effect on our lives you the, know the, there's, directly. there's the fact that it it spins at the same rate that it goes around the earth so it always presents one face to, to the Correct. earth like this uh, now I if you read why that's happened so it's a gra like a gravitational yeah, that drag it, yeah that it was spinning at some point and one half of it is attracted to the earth more because it's, it's got greater weight yeah so it's so it eventually it's it's it starts to so mass, i would yeah. say well why doesn't why doesn't the earth, why hasn't that happened to the earth going around the sun why doesn't the earth present one face to the sun why mm. does the earth still spin and the other planets still spin mm. so why doesn't why why is the moon locked into this it's almost uh, it's almost as if they, they've designed to keep it's been designed to keep this one, one side, side hidden, hidden from, from the people earth. on the earth but you can't say that that's you can't you can't say anything you that other than this it's a coincidence yeah, kind coincidence. Of thing, right okay. yeah so <laughs> yeah and i mean we know just to mention david ike's book that people i'm sure may write you about the moon matrix mm. and stuff and he reckons that the moon is some type of regulating or control mechanism for this holographic matrix uh, that we've all you know mm. we all live in and uh, on the earth i mean it, it, i haven't read his book so i can't really comment you know he could mm. be right for all i know 
but uh, so there's a lot of a lot of uh, theories and speculation about mm. what the moon is and what it isn't. Uh, but personally, you know, I haven't looked into those things, so I don't I don't think I can usefully comment other than that I know these ideas are out there. You know. All right, Andrew. Well, um, thanks for today, and uh, we are going to do another show uh, where we're going to look at other bodies within the solar system, such as Mars and Phobos. But until then, believe none of what you hear and only half of what you see. I'm Richard D. Hall. Good night.